Hungary is one of only two NATO members, along with Turkey, still to ratify Sweden's membership application. It's also stood out among NATO and EU states for its opposition to the supply of military equipment to Ukraine. But it has supplied humanitarian aid and called for a diplomatic solution. And amid all of this, its relations with Turkey have been growing stronger. I'm Andrew Hopkins, and I've been speaking to the Hungarian Foreign Minister, Peter Siato, one-on-one. Foreign Minister, thank you for talking to TRT World. First of all, I wanted to ask you, when will Hungary approve Sweden's NATO membership application? Well, uh, I'm afraid I'm not the right person uh, to raise this uh, question to, given the fact that um, the government has uh, done its homework quite uh, a long time ago. And uh, we have uh, submitted the uh, proposal, uh, the draft legislation, uh, to the parliament uh, already uh, last year uh, to um, approve the uh, membership of Sweden to NATO. But uh, the parliament has not decided yet to put this issue on the agenda. You know, uh, I don't want to be hypocritical. I have to admit that uh, since the government enjoys a very solid and wide-ranging support uh, in the parliament as the outcome of the elections, of course, the, uh, the ruling party has uh, more than two-thirds of the seats uh, in the parliament. Uh, it can be seen from far away that it's only up to us. But the thing is that uh, our parliamentarians uh, are very strong personalities. Uh, they have uh, won a series of elections already. Most of our uh, MPs um, have won five, six times. Uh, they, uh, um, they have been uh, going out for the votes. They have been competing uh, for the votes on very tough competitions on many occasions. And they have won uh, the seats. They have gained the trust uh, of the people. And when they do so, and uh, parallel to that, they hear from politicians hundreds of kilometers away from here that what they have been doing and what they have been involved in is neither democratic nor legitimate, then they feel insulted. And when the same politicians ask for a um, favor to be done quickly and uh, randomly, then uh, they say, OK, let's wait a bit. And to be honest, I understand their feelings. Because if these politicians who are now urging us and them to make quick decisions, made statements that what we are doing is not democratic, then uh, how to understand the situation? So it's up to parliament, it's up to our parliamentary group uh, to decide. Of course, they are looking for certain uh, gestures or insurances uh, that similar results will not take place um, in the future. So uh, the uh, parliament will come back to um, session sometimes in the middle of September. And then um, the parliamentary group, that's the parliament, uh, will have the chance to decide about the time. Now, you mentioned there about the problems you've had of, with criticism from other countries. You said a few weeks ago that the approval of Sweden's NATO membership is, is now just a, a technical matter. But before that, a few months before that, you had issues, you said, with Sweden, with politicians there criticizing uh, Hungary, the leaders here, the politicians here, denigrating them. So has this issue been resolved? And did you get any undertakings from Sweden on this? No, actually nothing, nothing. So when I said technical issue, I meant what I just told you, that uh, it's up to the parliament to decide. The draft proposal is there. So it's only up to the parliamentarians to decide when they would like to deal with this issue. That's what I meant, a technical case. Uh, but when it comes to um, these insults which have taken place, you know, um, I regret. I regret that the whole pol international political discourse is being now dominated by criticism, by judging each other, by lecturing each other, by interfering into domestic issues of other countries. And we Hungarians are targets, are victims of this very bad approach which dominates international political discourse now. But I guess I don't have to explain it to you, to Turkish. Because uh, in case of Hungary, we we always base our approach to other countries on uh, the basis of mutual respect. We do approach others with respect and we expect them to reciprocate that. 
but unfortunately, many of our partners here in Europe especially, they love to interfere into domestic issues of other countries. They love to act as teachers, you know, and they love to uh, speak to us as if we were students, you know, and they love to speak as if they have been on a higher moral grounds than we are. But this is not the case. We are a country with a thousand year long Christian statehood. Uh, we are mature enough to make a decision about our own future. We are mature enough to, uh, uh, to task the politicians, the leaders of the country, which direction to go. And we don't need the advices of, of others. Just on the issue of when the decision will come from Parliament, surely couldn't the, the Prime Minister, for instance, say, OK, I think it's time now to make this decision. I want Parliament to do this now. Isn't that a, a possibility? Some procedure could be done in this manner? We respect Parliament more than that. So we don't give such kind of instructions to Parliament. Prime Minister gives instructions uh, to the ministers, but we don't give instructions to, uh, to Parliament. Parliament will, uh, will decide. And we, of course, consult with the Turkish leadership. Prime Minister will take, usually takes the advantage of meeting the President of Turkey to discuss this uh, issue uh, as well. Uh, I have discussed this issue together with my new colleague, uh, Minister uh, Fidan. Uh, and uh, we agreed to stay in close connection and uh, whenever the parliament of any of the two countries makes a move, uh, we um, share this information with each other. Neo Prime Minister Viktor Orban has said that Sweden will not lose a minute in terms of its application for membership of NATO because of Hungary. So this sounds to me possibly like that Hungary is waiting for Turkey to approve uh, Sweden's application and then Hungary will do at the same time. Is this a true reflection of the situation at the moment? Well, uh, of course, we do not want to be and will not be a hurdle uh, to the membership of Sweden. But uh, since we understand uh, the, the draft proposal has not been uh, put on the parliament of the Turkish Grand National Assembly, we are not uh, late at all. And uh, the visit of the president of Turkey to Hungary gives us the chance uh, to, uh, to further... Um, communicate with each other and coordinate with each other uh, on this uh, on this matter so uh, uh, we um, we this has been the same uh, this had been the same when it comes to Finland for example so the Turkish leadership has um, shared with us the information uh, how they were uh, progressing on this uh, matter and we could adjust on that occasion you both approved Finland's yes. membership within days of each other I think it was so this showed uh, I think to a lot of people that there was this sort of cooperation. Go but go. we never denied that. Mm -hmm. We never, we are allies. Mm -hmm. We are allies in NATO. And uh, we have to take uh, the interests and the, um, we have to take into consideration the viewpoints of each other seriously. So if we speak about a military or a defense alliance, which is NATO, then the trust must be the basis of the cooperation. Let's talk about the war in Ukraine yeah. as well. Uh, again, on the agenda is the idea of how we can bring this uh, conflict to an end. And there's been a lot of talk in the media recently, people like the uh, former president of France, Nicolas Sarkozy, and also uh, a, a NATO official been reported as saying that maybe Ukraine can give up some land in order to make peace with Russia. So. Where do you stand on that particular issue, and in particular with uh, Ukraine's territorial integrity? Look, we are a neighboring country to Ukraine. So that puts us um, in a special situation, special position, because having a war in your neighborhood or having a war 1,000 kilometers away, this is a different situation. On top of that, what puts us in a unique, not only special, but a unique situation is that there's a significant Hungarian community living in Ukraine. Uh, and that's an indigenous community that had been living there always, forever. So uh, there's 150, there are 150,000 ethnic Hungarians living as a community in Ukraine. And members of this community have been dying, unfortunately, during the war, given the fact that they are Ukrainian citizens and um, according to the conscription and uh, mobilization regulations in Ukraine, many of them have been conscripted and then deployed to the uh, front lines and died, unfortunately. So uh, we are 
a nation in Europe in a unique situation, members of which are dying in this war. So when we argue in favor of peace as soon as it's possible, hopefully, possibly yesterday, you know, to come, then it's based on this approach. And unfortunately, our European friends and transatlantic allies are not able to understand the situation. So that's why we don't deliver weapons. That's why we do not allow weapon transit through Hungary. That's why we urge for peace, always. Peace as soon as possible, because the sooner the war ends, the less people will die and less Hungarian people will die. And we, would, we don't want to see any more casualties and we don't want to see any more Hungarian casualties. So the insurance for no more casualties is the end of the war, namely peace. So therefore, for us, peace talks to be started, ceasefire to be established, this is number one on our agenda. Of course, we as a country which had to fight for its own freedom uh, during its history, we are absolutely uh, in favor of the respect uh, of uh, the uh, phenomenon of uh, territorial integrity and sovereignty in case of all countries. And that goes to Ukraine as well. So yes, we stand up for territorial integrity and sovereignty of Ukraine, but we stand up very, very heavily and very, very determinedly uh, in favor of peace and uh, ceasefire. There is a, an article on the, the website of the uh, Hungarian embassy in Washington at the moment, which suggests that uh, Hungary's full support for Ukraine depends on the treatment of the ethnic minorities within Ukraine, which uh, I presume specifically refers to the Hungarian minority in the country there. So does this position still, is it still true for you that this does depend on the treatment of the ethnic minorities there? When it comes to um, our support to Ukraine's territorial integrity and sovereignty, that's unconditional. When it comes to our support to the Ukrainian refugees, it's unconditional. Look, we have received more than a million refugees here in Hungary, more than a million. Look, and we are a country of less than 10 million people. So we have received more than a million refugees here in Hungary. There are more than 1,300 schools and kindergartens in Hungary, which are enrolling refugee kids and students. We give uh, exactly the same rights to the refugees, what the Hungarian citizens do have when it comes to access to health care and education. We support them to, um, uh, to have job. We support them to have a kind of normal life uh, here in, in Hungary as much as it is possible. These are all torn apart families. It's hard bleeding to see because, you know, the, the men, the fathers had to stay. Terrible. So um, it's unconditional. But when it comes to um, our national community, national minority in Ukraine, we do expect the Ukrainians to give back all the rights to this community, which they used to have before 2015. So our conflict, or our debate, our debate with Ukraine on the issue of the rights of our national minority is not new. That goes back to 2015. 2015 was the first date when, uh, when the that time Ukrainian leadership started to violate the rights of the Hungarian community, diminishing the rights, especially when it comes to access to mother tongue education, culture, public administration, cult and so on and so forth. And now the, uh, the rights of the Hungarians are much more limited compared to 2015. And we cannot accept that. And we don't want anything extraordinary from the Ukrainian leadership. We just want one thing, that the rights which the Hungarians had in 2015 should be restored. Nothing more. Just what they already had in 2015. So we don't see the reason why these stepbacks have been made. And look, the Ukrainians would like to join the European Union. Uh, in order to join the European Union, you need to uh, respect certain common values. And among the common values, there's the issue of respect to the rights of national minorities, for example. So, um, in order to support Ukraine on progressing on the road to the European Union, there's a very tough condition by us, for sure, which is that they do have to pay respect to the rights uh, of our national uh, community. So when it comes to uh, helping their refugees and standing up for territorial integrity and sovereignty, it's of course unconditional. But when it comes to supporting their integration into uh, European uh, institutions, uh, then there's a condition.
Now, Hungary is also one of five EU countries which doesn't allow the import of Ukrainian grain at the moment, but it, it does allow the transit of it. Um, I understand that you've asked for this situation to continue until at least December this year. Now, how long do you see this situation continuing? Because it seems to be sort of connected essentially to the war. So I imagine you think it will finish once the war finishes. Is that right? Or what's your, your current situation on this, this subject? Look, the situation is the following. Uh, when uh, it became obvious that um, there could be a very severe consequence of this war uh, on countries in need for grain and other foodstuff in case the exports, both from Russia and Ukraine, are being cut, then it was obvious that we should help. That's why the, uh, that's why the decision about the solidarity lanes has been made. What the decision was about, that countries in the neighborhood of Ukraine ensure transit routes for the Ukrainian grain to be exported to countries which are in need of this grain, in Africa and Middle East. You know, that was the concept. But what happened, we opened these transit routes, they brought the grain here into the Central European countries, and they left it here. And uh, when we speak about, you know, it's a big hypocrisy there. Because, because the issue is how the grain will get to countries where there is a need for that grain, right? In order to save African and, uh, and uh, Middle East uh, people from hunger. And compared to this, they just brought the grain here. And uh, it's so unfair, it's so incorrect. Because in the meantime, they say that Africa needs their grain. OK, bring it there. We ensure the transit route. We have made huge investments here in Hungary. Uh, the, um, uh, we have built the biggest facility on the western border of Ukraine to de and reload the Ukrainian grain. So uh, we are ready to uh, ensure the transit route, but, but I mean, bringing the grain here is, is a no-go. Why? I mean, you know, the, it, it ruins the market here. It ruins the, the farmers because um, how to grow grain in Ukraine and how to grow grain according to European Union standards are two totally different leagues. Here in Europe, we have very strict regulations. So our farmers have to comply with very strict regulations when it comes to growing grain, which makes their production uh, activities much, much, much more expensive than in Ukraine. So, referring to poor people in Africa, making business here in Central Europe, that's no go. That's no go. So, therefore, we said, let's come back to original concept. Let's come back to original decision, ensuring transit route. And, and we, are, we, we are providing that. I suppose that's connected to the issue that the grain deal was set up uh, and is sort of directed by market forces. So, whoever will pay the correct price, will take delivery of the grain. But I wanted to ask you about how concerned you are about the fact that Russia has pulled out of the grain deal at the moment, and also whether that affects your thinking about whether Hungary would take grain from Ukraine, because it was not only about, I think, uh, sending grain to countries that need it, bringing down food prices, but also giving Ukrainian farmers help to earn a livelihood. So does this situation affect your thinking on this subject? In this regard, it does not change uh, our way of thinking. We will not allow the uh, Hungarian grain market to be ruined and we will not allow the uh, Hungarian farmers um, uh, to be destroyed. Uh, but when it comes to the grain deal, <coughs> we regret a lot. We regret a lot that it uh, has not been continued. And in, in this case, we have to applaud uh, the uh, leadership uh, of uh, President Erdogan and his team and the Turkish government. We have to applaud their efforts, what they have put into this issue to make it happen. And unfortunately, it didn't happen, but, uh, but we still should not give up the hope, I think. We still should uh, put all our efforts into this issue in order to make it happen, so uh, that the continuation of the implementation of the grain deal, uh, uh, grain deal uh, will be possible. So we hope that the ongoing efforts of Turkey will be successful. Also as well, the, the war in Ukraine has put a new focus on energy supplies. A lot of countries looking to 
diversify the sources of energy and Hungary is is one of those countries. And you've been talking, it seems, for several years now about Hungary joining the Southern Gas Corridor, the, the TANAP pipeline, which goes from Azerbaijan through Turkey and into Europe. So it seems like now there's even more of an impetus to get this done. And you've been talking about this to the countries involved. So where do things stand now? What kind of timeline have you got for Hungary to be linked into this pipeline? Irrespective from the Transanatolian <coughs> pipeline, Turkey has been playing an enormously important role when it comes to the safety of supply of natural gas to Hungary. Why? Because we have built the Turkish Stream Pipeline a couple of years ago. And if we had not built Turkish Stream together with Russia, Turkey, Bulgaria and Serbia, now we would be in a deep problem, to put it mildly. Because under the new circumstances, we would not be able we would not be able uh, to supply uh, Hungary with enough gas in case Turkey was not a reliable transit country and in case we had not built the uh, Turkish Stream pipeline. So uh, the capacity, incoming capacity of this pipeline to Hungary is 8.5 billion cubic meters, while our annual consumption is somewhere between 9 and 9.5 and billion. So basically, in case of an emergency, touch wood, it doesn't happen, uh, we would be able to supply ourselves exclusively through Turkey. But, of course, we don't want to experience such a situation. We have put a lot of efforts into diversification well before the war. So why we are making diversification has nothing to do with the war. That diversification efforts had been started much earlier than that. And in, in, in this regard, we consider Turkey, Azerbaijan and Qatar as very realistic uh, sources uh, to take part in our national energy mix. Uh, we have been discussing with Azerbaijan about uh, deliveries up to 2 billion cubic meters annually in the future. Uh, the first contract is about 100 million cubic meters for this year that the deliveries have been started. So the physical gas connection between Azerbaijan and Hungary has been established. A lot depends on Turkey. So uh, uh, if Turkey allows um, an, appro uh, an access to us uh, to its national grid, to the Transanatolian pipeline, then we will be able to build up um, a contract with uh, Azerbaijan to one or two billion cubic meters in the future. But in the meantime, we look at Turkey not only as a transit country from now, but as a source country as well. So um, luckily enough, we were able to close a deal uh, in the framework of which next year, almost 300 million cubic meters of gas will be bought from Botash. Uh, by the Hungarian uh, gas company. And this is going to be the first time that Turkey is going to be in our national energy mix as a source country for natural gas. And when it comes to Qatar, um, they are basically um, uh, sold out until 2026. So first realistic date uh, to put them on our national energy mix is 2027. There's a political agreement about that. So the commercial talks have been started between Qatar Gas and our a national gas company. Uh, we'll see uh, where they will get, but we are determined there as well. So Azerbaijan, Turkey and Qatar are realistic new sources. How is the gas being delivered to you at the moment from Azerbaijan and also this deal you've signed with Turkey, with Botash, where is that gas coming from? Is it coming from the new field that's been discovered in the Black Sea, Sakaria, or is it going to be something like uh, liquid natural gas, which I think Bulgaria signed a deal a few months ago with Turkey for delivery of that. How is that going to work between the two countries? So when we uh, make the agreement with Botash, we uh, leave the source to them. What we know is that we are buying Turkish land, so uh, for us it's Turkish and doesn't matter where it comes from. When it comes to the delivery route, that's a challenge, and i tell you why. Because if you look at the uh, energy infrastructure map of uh, Central and Southeast Europe, especially when it comes to gas pipeline infrastructure, you will see a lot of bottlenecks. And uh, big infrastructural developments will be needed to be completed uh, in this region in order to be able to uh, deliver big amount or big volume of gas from this region I mentioned to you before, Turkey, Azerbaijan, Qatar, to Central Europe. But what happens is the following. The European Union is putting pressure on us not to buy gas from Russia, but buy it from somewhere else. We say, okay, we are ready to diversify, but we need new delivery routes, please help us. Then they say no, because gas is not modern, gas is not sustainable, and, you know, we should look for green solutions. But, you know, okay, 
in a decade or two decades, maybe some other alternative sources of energy will be able to replace gas, but not now and not in the foreseeable future. So we need to invest in gas infrastructure in this region. So on one hand, European Union puts pressure on us to diversify. On the other hand, they shut their eyes and they don't help us. So the countries here in the region, Slovakia, uh, Romania, Serbia, us, uh, Bulgaria, Greece, Turkey, uh, we had a series of meetings, a number of meetings, on how to increase capacities here in this region in order to allow the system to be able to manage the delivery of big volume of gas from Turkey, Azerbaijan, Qatar, through Southeast Europe to Central Europe. Okay, Foreign Minister, thank you very much. Thank you so much for this interview.